Amen. We're in the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, and um, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. I know you were just up, but that's just like Pentecostals, up, down, up, down, up, down. Of course, that goes for everybody. Verse 1, Matthew chapter 6, take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest alms, do not sound the trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, and they that may have, that, that, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But, but thou doest alms, when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what the right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth thee in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret, or which seeth you in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when you pray... Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore likened unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you even ask. After this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash your face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. I want to use for a subject this morning some how-tos of Jesus. Some how-tos of Jesus. You may be seated. In the fifth chapter of Matthew... Jesus teaches us how to live the law of God in our hearts, from our hearts. In this fifth chapter, he teaches us that he had fulfilled the law, and he had paid the penalty for the breaking of the law, and that he would put the law of God written on our hearts, and that we would worship God and serve God from the heart. In other words, we will keep the law from our hearts. This is a sermon from the, which is called the Sermon on the Mount, and it takes up chapter 5, 6, and 7, which is the longest recorded message that Jesus ever preached. In these three chapters, 5, 6, and 7, Jesus covers what God expects out of us as citizens of the kingdom of God. We need to prepare ourselves, live for God, honor God, because Jesus has a kingdom. And you and I, as born-again children of God, are part of that kingdom. Chapter 6, 
chapter 5, he teaches us how to keep the law from the heart. In chapter 6, he teaches us how to serve God from our heart. And so this chapter 6 is showing us how to give from our heart, how to pray from our heart, and how to fast with a hungry heart for God. So in these verses that I read to you, how to give, not what you give, how you give. Let me say that right now. It's not what you give, it's how you give. Now, what you give matters to the preachers probably, and what you give matters to others, but how you give matters more to God. Amen. How you pray. I may, I may know that God's people need to know how to pray. They need to be taught to pray. They need to know how to pray. And Jesus says in verse 1 through 4, how, he gives us how, to, how, how we should give. In verses 5, uh, 14 through, or actually verses 5 through 15, he tells us how to pray. And then in Matthew chapter, or chapter 6, verse 16 through 18, he tells us how to fast and have a hunger for God. Now, I want to start by simply saying that when Jesus addressed how to give, he mentioned it in the first four verses of this chapter 6. He said, take heed. Don't be like the Pharisees that blow the trumpet. Don't be like those that want to draw attention because look what I give. I'm a giver. I want everybody to see what I'm doing. And Jesus went as far as to say, don't let your left hand or your right hand know what the other hand's doing. Does that mean that we shouldn't give publicly an offering? That's not what it's saying at all. He's just saying you should not get up and toot, 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 toot your horn about what you're doing, what you're giving. And there are a lot of people today that if they don't get some kind of recognition, they're not going to give a penny. We are blessed to be part of an incredible church. We're kind of like a country church. We're not very big, but we are incredibly blessed with givers. It's amazing, and in fact, it's a miracle just how generous and how loving our people give to the work of the Lord. The Bible says, take heed how you give. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on verses 1 through 4 because our church pretty much has this totally under control. We're a small church, not a lot of revenue, but we needed a roof. And all the money came in, $32,000 worth. We needed to treat the parking lot, and all the money came in, $13,000 worth. We needed a shuttle to bring people to church, and all the money came in, $62,500 worth. We needed a mower, and the money came in, $9,200. We've been on television ministry. We bought equipment. We have the building paid for. This building is totally paid for. And the church is not in debt in any such manner. Because our people have a heart to give. Now, if you've been coming to our church for any time at all, you know that I don't get up and manipulate people to give. I just simply preach the Word of God, and God-loving people and Jesus-thrilled people will take care of the needs in the church. You don't sound a trumpet. You don't want recognition. In fact, people who give uh, gifts to our church usually ask me, please don't say a word. Because they understand that their reward is not from us, but from God Almighty when they give. Jesus talks in this verse 1 through 4 how we should give. I don't think I need to spend another moment on that because you know how to give. It's been proven over and over again. The soundboards in the church, the equipment in the church, visitors say over and over again, I wished our church had 
a sound system like you do. Of course, we've got an incredible um, technician, associate pastor, one that knows how to actually work through media ministry. I do not. I don't even know when to get a haircut half the time. <laughs> My wife said to me, you are not going to church till you get a haircut. She said, you sit down there and let me give you a haircut. You're growing extra hairballs on the back of your neck. <laughs> and she removed them. And she almost removed my ears, but she got it done. <laughs> Jesus takes some time not only to teach us how to give, in which manner we should respond in our giving. Now, once again, it's not, it's not what you give, it's how you give. Judy and I have purpose in our hearts that we give 10% love offerings on top. And that's more from discipline than anything else. I met a Christian brother the other day, and he said, I give 20% of all my income. He wasn't saying that bragging. He, would, he had just left a good tip of 20% on the waitress table at an eating place we were. And he said, if I can tip a waiter or a waitress 20%, I can give to my God 20%. I thought, wow, he's got his priorities right. So... A good starting place would be 10%. You say that, don't say that in the Bible. Well, Paul said in the scriptures, let a man give according to he purposes in his heart. And that's the truth that Jesus is getting. Do it from your heart, and you won't need recognition from anyone but God. Amen. So I'm not here to do any uh, teaching on how to give because you know how. And you also know when to give and what to give because obviously all around us is the evidence of your generous giving. If there's a need, we step up. As a church, if there's a need, we step up because we have a heart to give. And God who sees us in secret rewards us openly. Amen. So he not only tells us how to give, not what to give, but how to give. He tells us how to pray. I think it's important that we understand that not only do we give from the heart, we must pray from the heart. In fact, the scripture is very careful to say, avoid performance praying. I've heard some of them performance prayers. And... I fell asleep in some of them. We used to have a guy in my church years ago that you, you could tell he memorized prayers all week long so he could impress the rest of us when he was called on to pray. He would stand up and go through big words and words I'd never heard before and he'd pray long and loud because he was performing for us, not to God. Notice it says in verse 5, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto that they have their reward. So when we pray, we never pray to perform for someone in our reach of our speaking. Nor do we pray to perform and entertain ourselves. Our prayers should be raw from the heart, talking to God, crying out to God, and you don't have to be a big blowhart theologian to do so. Amen. I said amen. Now, if you're a big theologian, then you're okay because I didn't say you were a blowhard. So we're told how to pray. We're told what not to pray. Don't be praying by performance. 
But then in verse 6, it tells us how to stay and pray in our closet. How to stay and pray. Don't miss the word, stay, stay. How to stay in prayer or stay in the closet there to pray. He teaches how to stay and pray in your closet. The first thing I want to say is, look at verse 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and uh, thy Father which seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. That's a pretty incredible verse of Scripture. The Bible says that when we pray, we are to go into our closet, stay there, and talk to God, because God will see us in our closet. God will hear us from our closet. Now, the first point I want to bring out is, first of all, you've got to go in your closet. You've got to choose to say, I am not going to be distracted. You've got to choose to find somewhere alone with God. You've got to choose and go into your closet. That's a choice. We as children of God have a choice. We can go in to the presence of God, into our private place of prayer, and we can stay there and worship God, or we can spend a whole day and never go inside, never go into our closet, our closet of prayer. Go into your closet. You'll not get anything done until you go into your closet. I hear preachers say all the time, well, I just pray driving down the road. And I just pray, you know, when I'm going to church. And I just pray when, I, when I'm singing. I just pray when I'm working. I just pray all the time. Well, I'm glad you do. So do I. But you are not worth two hoots to a hoot owl if you don't spend some time alone with God. You've got to stop what you're doing and go into your saluted, a secluded place and worship God. You've got to stop. Stop your worrying. Stop your activity. Stop your must, must be doing things of the day. Stop your busy activities and go into the closet A prayer. You'll never get it done until you go in your closet. Amen. And when you go in your closet, nobody else wants to be in there with you. I know I don't. Hello? Come on, I won't invite anybody else into my closet. I have a walk-in closet, but this is the guy that's going to walk in, nobody else. Judy has a closet, I have a closet. I'm not going to walk into Judy's closet because I'm afraid I'd get lost. I can walk into my closet. I don't know where everything is. I know just how it goes. I know if anything's been moved. And if my wife brings some kind of dress in there and hangs it on my hanger in my closet, I know that I have been intruded upon. Well, I don't leave my pants in her closet. So we share a closet, that's fine. But don't necessarily share a closet with people when you're praying. Now a husband and wife can get together and pray, but there's some things the husband don't want to mention aloud to his wife. And there's some things his wife don't want to mention aloud to her husband. There's some things that I want to talk to God about that's none of your business. Amen. Say, what are they? I told you, it's none of your business. <laughs> Can't you hear me? Go in your closet, step inside, shut the door with you inside of it. Go into your closet, shut the door with you inside it. Shut the door, you inside. When you shut the door, you inside, you're alone with God. When you shut the door, you inside, you can talk to God. When you shut the door and you inside, the world's not there. When you shut the door and you inside, nothing on the outside is around you because you inside. 
I love being inside with the Lord. So Jesus Christ says, take time. Get in the closet. Shut the door. You inside. And when you get in there, don't pray fearfully or nagging prayers. Don't pray fearfully, doubt, doubting, na or nagging prayers. Verse 7. But when thou pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore likened unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. You say, well, why should I even ask if God already knows what I need? Because you need to ask, even though God knows what you need, so that when you get what you need, you'll give praise to God because you knew God answered your prayer. That's why. There's a God in heaven that still answers prayer. Amen. See, we as a church have been praying for a van. How many know our van, you could, the white van, you could park it in the junkyard and it would look like all the rest of them? It wore out. And we started praying the Lord would provide us a new van. You, as, you in the church, you prayed that the Lord would provide us a new van. Not in my wildest dreams did I believe that we would ever end up with a shuttle that has 17,000 miles on it. And never did I dream that we could come up with $62,500 for a shuttle. Why? Because Ephesians 3.20 now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to that power that works in us. You know, you just have to excuse me, but that shuttle is where God showed out. When God paid off this building in such a short time, that's when God showed out. When God met the needs of this church, that's when God showed out. Because you gave and it glorified your Father which is in heaven. Your good works shine before all of us and we saw those good works and we gave glory to God. We give glory to our Father which is in heaven. Amen. I'm preaching better than you're responding. Amen. So when you go into your closet or any time, don't be praying fearful or nagging prayers. Don't get together and do a bunch of chanting. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as a heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard because of their much speaking. You're to go to God, talk to God, and God is very clear that when you're praying and talking to God, it's not a time to get together and chant, 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 chant. You're not talking to a false God. You're talking to a true and living God. You don't chant, 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 because you're not talking to some satanic uh, idol somewhere. When you talk to God, you don't chant, 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 chant. You go to God and you present your need to the Lord. You cry out to God with not vain repetition. You don't just whine and nag God and tell God, you got to do it, God. 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 Oh, you got to do it, God. You got to do it, God. You got to do it, God. And God says, I ain't got to do nothing. Jesus says, don't you be nagging. Don't you be saying the same thing over and over. Now, do I pray the same thing over? Every Sunday morning, I pray. Every time, I pray again for you. Every Sunday morning, I pray again for those that have been battling cancer in our church. Every Sunday morning when I gather, I pray for them that's been battling with sickness in their bodies. I pray for the families that are grieving. And I don't do it just one time. I pray several times on a regular basis for those needs. That's not what Jesus is talking about when he says you pray for the same thing over and over again. He means just chanting prayers. He means just repeat, nagging God out of fear and unbelief. You ask God in faith. Amen. God's teaching us how to pray. 
And he's showing us some things what not to do. We're to go into the closet and talk to God. We're to shut the door with us inside. I want you to notice we read the Lord's Prayer, verses 9 through 13. But there are bookends to the Lord's Prayer. There are actually two bookends to the Lord's Prayer. Did you know that? Now, the Lord's Prayer is not really the Lord's Prayer. It's the Lord's model prayer. The Lord's Prayer is in John chapter 17. But the Lord's Prayer is a recipe and a guideline for us to pray. It's not something we just quote over and over again and say we prayed. It is a guideline and how to pray and how to approach God, this Lord's Prayer. It's a recipe. It's a, it's a blueprint. It's a guidance. But he has two bookends to this Lord's Prayer. Let, let's look at it again. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in, uh, in earth, as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. How many love bread? I love bread. Nice, hot, warm bread. Yummy, yummy. Amen? And I, and I love having my needs met. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts. Oh, yeah, I ask God all the time to forgive me as we forgive our What? We're to forgive other people. Whoa. And then it says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I want you to understand that there are actually two booking ends to this prayer. The first book end is actually telling us, as I mentioned a moment ago, we're not to chant and nag God. We're to go intelligently before the Lord. And that's found in verse 7 and 8. I read it to you already. That book into the Lord's Prayer is we're not to nag and chant and believe that we're heard by much speaking to God, that God knows our need. The second book in is at the end of the Lord's Prayer in verse 14 and 15, and it talks about forgiveness to others. It says, verse 14, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, that just puts a whole new stigma on our praying if we are rude and unforgiving. Notice the manner in which you can pray. You can take the Lord's Prayer, Tyler, and you can pray for two or three hours just on this outline. You could take the Lord's Prayer and pray easily an hour just on this outline. This outline of the Lord's Prayer. Jimmy, you could pray for an hour just with this outline. Donnie, you could pray for an hour just with this outline. He said, well, preacher, how does that work? You begin by saying, he said, after this manner, in other words, prayer should have manners and, and should have a structure. And he said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father. You point your prayer to our Father, which is in heaven. You understand that our Father is above all. He's in heaven over all. Hallowed be thy name. That verse 1, or verse 9, rather, the first verse of the Lord's Prayer, verse 9, it tells us that we should, first of all, begin our prayer with focusing on God and heaven and giving God honor and praise. We should worship the Lord. We should tell God that we need Him, we love Him, we appreciate Him. We should thank him for his gifts and thank him for his blessing. We should honor him and, and adore him and worship him. And that'll take several minutes just to worship the Lord. In fact, I've seen where it takes me several hours just to worship the Lord, just to tell God how much I appreciate him and love him and care for him. And so after you pray a while to God and you worship God because his name is holy, then you beseech God to change things in your life. For Jesus to return, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 
Take some time to beseech God to do things in your life and take some time to ask God to return, to ask God to give you strength and to give you comfort. Notice says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Let's, let's, let's take earth. How many, I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask a crazy question. How many of you people live on earth? I've met a few people that don't. But anyway, you live on earth. So if you live on earth, then let's take the word, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And let's remove the word earth and say, my family. Thy kingdom, thy will be, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my family as in heaven. Let's take the word and, and let's replace it with the word me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in me as it is in heaven. Let's take the word earth and, and you're having trouble at work. Thy will be done, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in work or at work as it is in heaven. Take time to spend time praying about your family needs, your personal needs, your strength that you need from God and give God the glory and ask his kingdom to reign supreme in your life. Honor him as king of kings and lord of lords. And then after you pray a while like that, that, then we come to another thing we do. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, most people, that's the only thing they pray. They start out, oh, Jesus, I need a new car. Oh, Jesus, I need some money. Oh, Jesus, I need you to move and, and bless my family real good. You're rude. Go to God. Worship God, honor God, reverence God, hallowed uh, be thy name, give him glory, give him honor, ask his will to be done in your life, give your heart to, to the Lord, dedicate everything you are to the Lord, and then ask God for your needs. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. And then verse 13. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Most of us had that verse backwards. We said, God, please forgive me for my temptation. We got it backwards. God, please forgive me for my bad stuff I did. Well, there's a time for that, and we'll get to that in the next few verses. But notice it says, lead us not into temptation. That verse is trying to say, if you pray, go into your closet, talk to God, and you call out to God, you can avoid a lot of bad things in your life. You can avoid a lot of tragedies in your life if you'll spend time in the presence of God. Now, you can't avoid everything. There's sickness, there's disease, there's death, there's heartbreak, there's, there's things. That you can't avoid everything, but you can avoid the devil making you a doormat. Well, I'm preaching better than you're responding. And trust me, you're not responding very well. So we're to ask God to del deliver us from temptation. Then we're to praise God again. Notice it says, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we start with praise and worship. We take all these things to God, and then we close with praise and worship. We thank him for all he's done. I went through uh, quite a while this morning just thanking God for everything he's done. I thought God, I thank God today for the shuttle. I thank God for the building being paid. I thank God for my life. I thank God for a, a wonderful wife. I thank God for a wonderful family. I thank God for his comfort, for his strength. I just, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. I spent a lot of time thanking God. And then we're supposed to worship him. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I mean, we agree that's an awesome phrase. So we start with worship and praise, and we end with worship and praise. Don't just go barging in and say, God, forgive me. Go before God with worship and praise. 
Go through the process, and when you close your prayer, then give him praise again. Worship him again. Give him honor again. Give him thanksgiving again. Now, notice it says, after you get contact, after you really get saturated in prayer, you would think that verse 14 and 15 would have been put next to verse 12. But no, Jesus had them closing their prayer, and then verse 14 and 15 is put after you have went through the process of prayer. Verse 14 and 15 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Isn't that good? Just a word of caution. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So there's a, there's a little bit of caution there. That if you won't forgive those that are indebted to you, don't expect God to forgive you since you're indebted to Him. So we worship God. I'm convinced that true worshipers in spirit and truth, I'm convinced that true children of God care when they've hurt someone else. They care when there's a a problem with someone in their life. They care about transgressions. They care. And I'm I'm, I'm sure, at least I'm positive, that spirit-filled Christians, it matters a great deal to them that they're not offensive to others. And it matters a great deal to them that they forgive those that have hurt them. So how do I forgive those that hurt them? How do I forgive those that despitefully use me? How How do I forgive those that transgress for me? From me? All right, let's say Harry hurt me bad. If you're Harry in this room, shave. But anyway... You know, if your name's Harry, excuse me, this is just an illustration. Let's say Harry spit in my face, said some bad things about me, and he offended me. And now I'm struggling with unforgiveness toward Harry. You say, well, how do you, preacher, forgive Harry? Here it is. Lord Jesus, I ask you to bless Harry. I ask you to touch his life and just give him your blessings. Jesus, I forgive Harry. I love Harry in Jesus' name. I've had people say to me, well, if I forgive them, then I'm condoning what they did. Well, don't get mad at me, but you're kind of a hypocrite when you say that. But if I don't forgive them, if I forgive them, then I'm condoning what they did. That, you know, that's like Jesus saying, well, if I forgive you, I'm condoning what you've done in the past. Amen? Jesus never condones our sin, but he still died on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. You say, but he said, they know not what they do. He's just saying they had insanity in their life. They didn't understand the complications and the results of their sin, how, how tragic, tragic it would be in their life. But Lord, he said, God, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Jesus even did that. On the cross, are you listening to me? Let me me look at you. Let me stare you down. So you are looking right at me. Yep, I'm going to make your statement true. When Jesus was beat, when Jesus was spit upon, when Jesus was cursed, when Jesus was whipped, when Jesus was crucified, nailed upon a cross, when Jesus was unappreciated for his miracles, unappreciated for his glory, when Jesus was rejected of men, when Jesus went to that cross, what's the thing he did? He forgave them. He forgave them. Now it's up to them whether or not they receive Jesus Christ. It's up to them whether or not they receive the benefits of Jesus Christ. But he forgave them. Amen. So the book ends is clear. If we don't forgive men of their trespasses, neither will our Father forgive our trespasses. We need to be people of forgiveness. 
Then verse 10 through 18 talks about how to fast. And of course, it tells us the hypocrites, they got real sad in their face. When they're fasting, the hypocrites got real sad in their face. You know, I don't know why they call it fasting because it's so slow. When I decide to fast, it is so slow. But moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. They disfigure their face. They ruffle their hair that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto, say unto you, they have their reward. What they would do is when they seen someone coming, they'd ruffle their hair. They wouldn't comb their hair. They'd put a sad face and then walk with Bill. What's the matter? I'm fasting. Amen? People even do that today. And by the way, if your Bible doesn't say fasting, get you a Bible. But there are people that say, well, I don't want to say anything, but, you know, I'm fasting. Well, you have your reward because you did say something. Is it okay that others fast and they find out you're fasting? Yeah, that's okay, but don't make a big ado out of it. Amen? See, so when you fast, you're supposed, verse 17, you're supposed to anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto God which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. So when you fast, you talk to the Lord, you get a hunger in your heart for God more than you do for material substance. You get a hunger in your heart for, for, for the food of the Spirit instead of the food of the flesh. You get a hunger in your heart. You begin to fast and talk to God and cry out to God. You're not to pretend to others that you're really having a hard time because you see you're fasting. I know, and please don't misunderstand me because I'm not here to make enemies, but I, I, you just need to understand, if you're old, don't act your age. Shucks! If you're old, don't act your age. If you've got something wrong in your Zachariah, don't act your age. <laughs> now, if that's real, it's real. But if it's not real, don't act your age. By the way, don't act your sickness. Don't act your sickness. I know folks that it's just like when the doctor says, you've got this, this, and this. You say, yep, sugar diabetes is Lord. Yep, heart disease is Lord. The doctor says, you've got cancer. Yep, cancer is Lord. No, Jesus is Lord. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. So if you have cancer or Sickness, and trust me, I know what I'm talking about. Trust me, I'm not just preaching something I've heard. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. If you're struggling with some things, then don't act your age. And don't act your sickness. Act, act out that you're a child of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen? Because you see, sympathy is not going to get you a reward from God. It might get you a reward from man, but sympathy is not going to get you a reward from God. Let me tell you what it gets you a reward from God. Head up straight, chin up, love Jesus Christ. No matter come hell or high water, I'm going to serve God. No matter what I face, I'm going to honor God. I'm not going to let things keep me from 
serving God, not going to keep obstacles in my, my economy and my finances to keep me from giving to God. I'm not going to let my, my sickness keep me out of the house of God unless it's not possible for me to be there. I've had people come to me, and, and I, I'm not going to mention any names, and you don't know the person anyway, but I had a person come to me, and they said, I'm going to have a, a toenail removed, and I'll be back in a month. I said, lady, excuse me, I said, I, I said, I can grow a new toe in a month. They can wear, you know, the, the weather forecast can come out on Thursday. It's going to be raining Sunday, and, and, and people won't, they'll make plans to miss church because it's going to be stormy and raining Sunday. And they hear it Thursday, and the weatherman is Lord. No, Jesus is Lord. Amen? Baptists are known for their baptizing people in water. And they baptize people in water, 900 to 1,000 gallon tank. Yet one raindrop will wipe out 10,000 Baptists out of church. <laughs> Amen. In the wintertime. Oh, the weatherman says it's going to snow and, and I'm making plans to miss church for a couple of months. And, and you'll run terrified to the store Murphins or wherever, and you buy everything you can get, and you're, you're screaming back home, I gotta stock up, I gotta stock up, and then a little powder comes, and then you're back in Walmart. Well, I can't go to church because crowds make me nervous, but you can go to a ball game, you can go to the grandkids' basketball game. I want you to understand, crowds may make you nervous, but we don't have crowds here. <laughs> have you a seat? So I don't like going to church because I don't like loud preaching. Well, we do that, have that here. But you can sit in the back, way back, in the fellowship hall. And like my mother-in-law, we put speakers everywhere. And even my mother-in-law, great mother-in-law, wonderful lady, Eva, many of you remember her, sweet lady. And, and when we first built this church, we put speakers in the bathrooms. And I'm preaching away. And after service, she comes out of the women's bathroom madder than an old wet hen. She says, son. I said, what? She said, I can't even go to the bathroom without hearing your voice. And then there's those groups that they come to church, but they find every reason to hang out in the foyer. They come to church, but they find every reason to be somewhere other than the preaching of God's Word. There's that group that will, it takes five people to babysit one child, to take care of one child. I know of no child that needs five people to take care of him unless it would be Caleb, my grandson, and he needs 20. I'm just, you know, it, it, I'm ranting and raving. You say, well, preacher, you keep this up. We're going to get a, new past, a brand new pastor. No, you're not. We might get a new congregation, but we ain't getting a new pastor. <laughs> I used to tell people there's two places you cannot go with me in, in this church. Number one, you can't go with me in the pulpit. It's none of your business. This is between me and the Lord. And number two, you can't go in the bathroom with me because it's my business, period, not yours. Amen. Uh, 
I love that Bobby. Praise God. Amen. I love Bobby's preaching. I love his singing. Just an incredible man of God. I love you, buddy. Love the ministry. Looking forward to the tent revival. Looking forward to the revival down in Galena. Looking forward to Josh taking care of you folks for a couple of weeks. Looking forward to getting away from you. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I come back, this place will be packed, and they'll say, oh, we thought you were gone. <laughs> and I'll say, I'm back. <laughs> so we're going to pick up next Sunday morning. Where are we going to pick? Oh, Mother's Day next Sunday morning. We're going to talk about treasures in heaven. We'll be going through some great scriptures next Sunday morning. I want you to understand that the greatest thing that you can do for your life as a Christian is learn how to stop what you're doing and go into your closet. Shut the door, you inside, and spend time with the Lord and pray and talk to your God in secret. And then folks will say, something is different about you. Something has changed in your life. You say, yep, I changed and got a new set of clothes in my closet. I got a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Amen. Stand with me. You say, why are you preaching like you are this morning? Because I'm getting in practice for Galena, First Baptist. Do you understand? You go to a Baptist church, you've got to really know how to preach. Because they preach. Don't misunderstand me, but there are way too many Pentecostals that are way too proud that they're Pentecost. You better be proud that you're a son of God, child of the Lord. Amen. Josh going to play and sing, and I want to invite you to come to an altar. If nothing but to say to God, I need a new prayer life. I need to learn, to grow, to give, to fast. I need to know how to give, how to pray, and how to fast. I need you, and I need your guidance that I will not be like others. I will be real in the presence of Jesus Christ. Altars open. Josh, go ahead. <laughs>